It's a pleasure to welcome you all this evening and a privilege to introduce our speaker, a colleague of mine at Toronto Metropolitan University, Dr. Rob Goodman. On January the 6th, 2021, a popular insurrection sought to overturn the election of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States. Thousands of his supporters descended on Washington, D.C. to prevent a joint session of Congress from counting the Electoral College votes to formalize Biden's victory, even though he won a strong popular majority across the country. Pandemonium, pandemonium broke out in the Capitol as rioters targeted senior politicians who had defied Trump's claim that the election was stolen. A week later, the House of Representatives impeached Donald Trump for inciting an insurrection making him the only president to be impeached twice. But he was acquitted after enough Republicans in the Senate voted against the motion. Many today continue to support the idea that Biden won the election through fraud. Since taking office, President Biden has introduced many landmark pieces of legislation to revive manufacturing jobs, expand infrastructure, and critical new technologies committing more than $400 billion through the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act, to mention just two. Economic growth and employment have revived. Inflation has slowly, gradually declined. And following a chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the U.S. has led the support for Ukraine following Russia's invasion, now almost two years ago. Many would agree that Biden has returned a measure of dignity and seriousness to the White House. Despite these advances, however, his popularity remains low. Meanwhile, Trump faces no less than 91 charges across four criminal indictments for business fraud, mishandling classified documents, and election interference. Yet he remains the front runner to be the Republican nominee in the 2024 presidential election. Many fear what might happen to democracy in the United States should he be allowed to run and win again. The state of democracy here in Canada seems to be in much better shape. Yet the convoy that occupied Ottawa for several weeks to protest against vaccine mandates during the pandemic, rising provincial tensions in the last year or two, probably longer, and growing partisan acrimony in Ottawa, certainly in the House of Commons, underscores that polarization afflicts our politics as well. So what does it mean to live next to an eroding democracy? Does Canada have the political, cultural, and historical resources to resist these forces and trends? Or will it follow, or will it follow excuse me, a path similar to the United States? Our guest this evening brings the insights and experiences of a scholar as well as a political speechwriter to explore these questions. Rob Goodman is my colleague at the Department of Politics and Public Administration at TMU, where he teaches and writes on topics such as populism, rhetoric, and the history of political thought. Dr. Goodman received his PhD with distinction from Columbia University in 2018, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at McGill. Before pursuing an academic career, however, he worked as a speechwriter for the US House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer and Senator Chris Dodd, and then went on to be an award-winning writer. Some of his books are written for broad popular audiences, such as Rome's Last Citizen, The Life and Legacy of Cato, mortal enemy of Caesar, or A Mind at Play, How Claude Shannon Invented the Information Age, both books co-written with Jimmy Sonny. Others are academic works of intellectual history and political thought, including his recently published book, Words on Fire, Eloquence and Its Conditions, and a forthcoming edited volume titled Populism, Demagoguery, and Rhetoric in Historical Perspective. Rob is currently pursuing a new project on race and American oratory, which promises many new insights. But it's his most recent book, published just uh, a month ago, I believe, Not Here, Why American Democracy is Eroding and How Canada Can Protect Itself, that's the focus of his talk this evening. Rob will speak for about 30 minutes. I'll then start a conversation with him to explore some of the issues raised in his lecture with my colleague from TMU, Dr. Jennifer Tunnicliffe, before we open the door to your questions and comments. A human rights historian, Jennifer is the author of Resisting Rights, Canada International Bill of Rights, 1947 to 76, which challenges the narrative of Canada as a historic advocate for international human rights. She's also the co-editor of Constant Struggle, Histories of Canadian Democratization, 
a volume that explores the historical realities that have shaped how democracy has been understood and practiced in the history of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Rob Goodman. Thank you all. Our neighbor is an eroding democracy. Canadian politics needs to start from that reality because it is the political fact with the furthest reaching consequences for Canadian life. Canada is not exempt from the polarization, the authoritarianism, and the conspiracizing that have put the future of American democracy into doubt. But Canada is different. If those forces are not so advanced here, it's not because Canada is congenitally behind the times. It's because our democracy can draw on a set of resources that are distinctly of this place. Our difference is not a luxury good, something for a rich and mostly contented people to worry about in the absence of more pressing concerns. On the contrary, it is a democratic immune system. This is the subject of my book, Not Here. Um, and in lieu of talking about the entire argument of the book, I thought I'd read in particular from one of the chapters in which I talk about this democratic immune system called Solidarity. As I write this, and, and note this was a, roughly a year ago, so I'm sure the number is going to be higher now, 277 bills have been introduced in American state legislatures to ban or restrict the teaching of divisive concepts, such as critical race theory or the concept of systemic racism. These bills and the well-funded, well-coordinated national campaign behind them offered a master class in the art of changing the subject. The summer of 2020 was the summer of the George Floyd, George Floyd protests. The largest demonstrations against racial injustice and police brutality, or in any other cause in American history. The summer of 2021 was the summer of the CRT panic, a period in which the focus of American anger was skillfully transferred from the figure of a police officer with his neck on George, knee on George Floyd's neck and the systems of impunity that brought knee and neck into fatal contact to the figure of a public school teacher instructing, quote, our kids to hate America and hate each other, in the words of a Republican press release. That is from a real figure to an imagined one. The backlash was announced and carried through so openly that it was almost a relief from the smog of plausible deniability in which most political malefactors go about their work. As the protests and civil unrest following Floyd's murder entered their second month, a group of Republican senators, the ones who just entered, uh, issued the press release I just quoted, introduced a ban on the use of federal funds for the teaching of the 1619 Project, which stresses the central role of slavery in American history, a step that set the tone and messaging for much of the backlash that followed. The bill, as the usual format dictates, included a number of preambulatory statements or findings. Here are the last two. Number five, the 1619 Project is a racially divisive and revisionist account of history that threatens the integrity of the Union by denying the true principles on which it was founded. And number six, the federal government has a strong interest in promoting an accurate account of the nation's history through public schools and forming young people into knowledgeable and patriotic citizens. What those statements tell me is that the enemies of the sort of public history the 1619 Project represents really do understand something about its political stakes. It really did threaten the integrity of the Union. It really did make social cohesion and solidarity harder to imagine. Myths are coordination points. They do not have to be good or just or fair or right to coordinate us. So we might imagine the bill's authors as engaging in a kind of bloodless realpolitik, not in any direct reckoning with history. Their history may or may not be true, but that is not their most pressing concern. The federal government has a strong interest in legislating its truthfulness. That at least is what we might imagine if we gave them the benefit of the doubt. And yet if we do so, if we assume that there is some genuine public spirit in these Republicans' feelings for social cohesion, then we are led to ask, why is received history so important to America's social cohesion in the first place? Why is divisive and revisionist history such a threat? We could answer that question with another question. Besides received history, what else is there to keep the peace? When public schools are effectively segregated, when public spaces are shadowed by random gun violence, when union membership, despite some recent high-profile success stories, remains in a generations-long decline, when wealth and income inequality surpass that of the Gilded Age, when the undemocratic Constitution puts meaningful political power out of reach, when the concrete and tactile bases of solidarity have been so methodically eroded. The only basis of solidarity left is story. Received history bears all of that tremendous weight under these conditions, it is the only thing that possibly can 
The United States is hardly the only country in which these conditions prevail, but the great weight placed on received history in American politics is an index of the failure of other material kinds of social cohesion in American life. That cohesion was not destroyed by insurrectionists or raving demagogues. It was destroyed by generations of normal politics. Of course, many of the same politicians who have done so much to erode material solidarity in America, who've undermined the public schools, who fought union organizing and universal health care with tooth and nail, are the ones most intent on enforcing the solidarity of received history by codifying it into law. So perhaps they're trying to undo the damage, to shore up the broken foundation with the only tools their way of thinking permits them to handle. Or maybe it is simply the case that material solidarity, the sort of bonds built by reliable public services or democracy in the workplace, is expensive from the point of view of capital. And maybe it is the case that immaterial solidarity, the kind of bonds built by enforcing a received history, is cheaper so that the, force from the shift from the former to the latter is nothing more than a cost-saving measure. That is one of the most important insights developed by W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction, his history of the Reconstruction period in America. His idea of the psychological wage is something of a skeleton key to American politics and to right populist politics more generally. The psychological wage was pioneered by the planter class and its successors in the American South, and later taken up by capitalists across multiracial America, all of whom converged by trial and error on a remarkable discovery. Workers would accept lower pay and worse material conditions if they were also compensated with a publicly honored place at the top of the racial hierarchy. Human beings crave honor, but the tokens of honor are fairly cheap in the scheme of things. They are, after all, tokens, status symbols whose worth lies in their exclusivity rather than in their intrinsic value. The psychological wage depressed the material wage, not through any conscious trade-off, but by sowing enmity and resentment. That strategy, wrote Du Bois, drove such a wedge between white and black workers that there probably are not today in the world two groups of workers with practically identical interests who hate and fear each other so deeply and persistently. The psychological wage and the movement against divisive concepts serve different purposes and grew out of different historical moments. But they are both founded on the same calculation. Social peace can be secured by material means or immaterial means, with wages and social services or stories and tokens. And the immaterial means usually cost less. It's just for this reason that Canada's marked lack of the usual unifiers, like a singular national identity, or a tradition of charismatic leadership, or a revolutionary founding, is so important on a concrete material level. On the one hand, disunity is, and always will be, I think, the Canadian problem. <laughs> but on the other hand, Canadian disunity means at least it's somewhat harder here to substitute the cheap solidarity of story for the costly solidarity of public goods. The harder it is to keep the social peace through shared received history, the more it has to be kept by material means, by the constellation of policies that are often called the social safety net. For someone who, like me, prefers wages and services to stories and tokens, this is a reason why Canadian disunity is so valuable. To some extent, we have already been through the worst that the divisive concepts crowd claims to fear, the displacement of our founders from their historical pedestal the retreat from history told as a straightforward story of integrity in the sense of either oneness or goodness. If that is the case, then whatever mortar binds us together will have to be made of decidedly prosaic stuff. Conversely, policies like universal health care and parental leave are not simply about health or children. They are part of the material infrastructure that makes it possible for us to reckon honestly and thoughtfully with our past. In fact, universal health care, the centerpiece of the Canadian welfare state, was debated and enacted precisely at the moment that the pivotal 20th century reckoning over Canadian identity was getting underway. I don't think that's a coincidence. To the extent that such a reckoning produces disunity and social conflict, which it will if we are doing it honestly and thoughtfully, the material infrastructure of the social safety net protects us from its worst effects. It frees us to be honest with one another. That is one of the things a social safety net is for collective social safety. You'll notice that I hedged a lot in that paragraph I just said. <laughs> to some extent, uh, for now, mostly, I know the danger of exaggerating our differences, as if historical reckoning is a particularly difficult course that Canada has passed and America keeps having to repeat. <laughs> 
Canada has its own ways of substituting immaterial recognition for harder and costlier material action. The phenomenon of cheap solidarity is by no means alien to Canada, but I do think at least it's a little less powerful here. To the extent that there is such a thing as a Canadian identity, identity it has to be cobbled together more out of social programs than a shared historical narrative. The healthcare system, for instance, recurs in surveys and polls as a defining mark of Canadian identity, not because it's so outstanding, but just for lack of alternatives. It bears some of the weight that the founding bears in American politics. But it's not only that these different kinds of solidarity ask different things of us. We experience them in essentially different ways. Compare the anonymous oceanic feeling of standing for the national anthem in a sports arena with the ability to look your neighbor in the eye as a social equal, someone who can legitimately claim the same social goods as you can, and the same social respect that goes with them. I've experienced both, and I prefer the latter. Mainly, I think, because it enables me to hold my head up as an individual, because I instinctively resist the kind of dissolution in a crowd that the mistier kinds of patriotism seem to require. The solidarity I prefer is small, dense, solid. Solidarity can exist perfectly well without sweeping narratives of national greatness or goodness. It lives in ordinary places, union meetings, doctor's offices, public schools. It works not only because those spaces when they're working well provide some goods essential to dignified, comfortable lives, but because they provide them in full public view. What is essential is not just that public goods are provided equally, but that they enable us to see other people as equal and to be seen as equals ourselves. A truce to status jockeying, the mutual recognition of peers. But do we really live like that in Canada? I have trouble claiming that we really do, at least in the sense that I would like. Not when union membership has been in decline for most of my life, not when in August 2022 in Ontario an average of 888, 884 people were waiting for an inpatient hospital bed each day. Not when 43,000 people left Nova Scotia emergency rooms in 2021 before being treated, presumably due to interminable wait times. Not when our overcrowded ERs are, quote, full of violence, tension, and anger, in the words of one longtime doctor. Not when our gap between house prices and incomes is by far the worst in the G7. Not when Toronto and Vancouver regularly top the lists of least affordable cities in the world. The housing crisis in particular puts the lie to our claims to have built a more equitable society. How much is the cost of housing taken from us collectively? How many deadening jobs and hours long commutes just to afford the rent? How many educations cut off prematurely? How many children never born? Into the sinkhole of housing costs have gone books that were never written, instruments that were never learned, hobbies that were never taken up, startups that, ne start that never made it off the page, dissent that was swallowed in the throat. All of these kinds of human flourishing, and many more, need time more than anything else. And so in a housing market with a ravenous appetite for our time, the hours of labor we are obligated to sell to keep a roof over our heads, all of these kinds of human flourishing become privileges for the few rather than entitlements for us all. Historically, it is at moments like this, moments at which it feels increasingly difficult to see ourselves and our neighbors as people sharing the same fate, that have been moments of the highest opportunity for the far right. I often think of a 1994 essay by the American writer Edward Lutwak that went viral again in the early Trump years. It is only mildly amusing, wrote Lutwak, that nowadays the standard Republican slash Tory after dinner speech is a two-part affair in which part one celebrates the virtues of unimpeded competition and dynamic structural change, while part two mourns the decline of the family and community values that were eroded precisely by the forces commended in part one. <laughs> Lutwak expected the tension to break. And when it did, he expected it to break in the direction of traditional values backstopped by an aggressive interventionist, corporatist state. The title of the essay was Why Fascism is the Wave of the Future. In my grandparents' generation, right-wing governments from Mussolini onward regularly co-opted the language of economic planning and socialism. The problem with capitalism was not that it enabled class domination, 
but that it undermined the traditions and integrity of the nation. In my own generation, it is once again increasingly common for so-called national conservatives to array themselves against big tech and woke capital. Their anti-market posture has not resulted in any concrete policy change, at least not yet. They're still happy to give woke capital a tax cut. But at the very least, the contradictions of these standard Republican slash Tory after dinner speech are beginning to grow unbearable. When Stephen Harper and Aaron O'Toole describe politics as a clash between rooted somewheres and the rootless anywheres, when Republican Senator Josh Hawley claims that the reigning political consensus shows little interest in our shared way of life, when Tucker Carlson celebrates Viktor Orban's Hungary as the rare country in which hard state power has been put in the service of traditional values and anti-immigration, they are all channeling a very old insight. Capitalism is the universal solvent. Think of how Orban himself put it, also in July 2019. In a liberal system, society and nation are nothing more than an aggregation of competing individuals. What holds them together is the Constitution and the market economy. There's no nation. Where there's no nation, there's no community. Much of the center left remains dumbfounded at the idea of a conservative leader saying anything critical at all about the market or consumerism or capitalism. But in the broad scope of history, this is the conservative idea. It descends from the reactionaries who organized the intellectual response to the French Revolution. It is the idea that ruled much of Europe in the 1930s and made serious inroads in North America, including here in Canada, and that is once more reasserting itself in our time. The more incoherent kind of conservatism, the kind in which market and family, capital and nation are squeezed together like opposite magnetic poles, may one day be seen merely as a brief interruption in that history. Yet today's national conservatism is not a project to preserve. It is a project to forcibly restore something that is imagined to have been stolen, something that wears various masks, manhood for Josh Hawley, or the Christian community for Viktor Orban, or that rooted somewhere. But that generally amounts to the same thing in each case, the powerful sense of an entirely lost social world. As usual, it is Orban who has made the point with the smallest degree of shame. Quote, this is why we Europeans have always fought. We are willing to mix with each other, but we do not want to become peoples of mixed race. In power, national conservatism may well be more generous with social goods than the conservatism of the free market that it is aiming to displace. But it will use these social goods for a decidedly illiberal purpose, to limit membership in the real people, to indicate physically and publicly who belongs and who does not. I've discussed why the publicness of these goods, a space like the public school drop-off or the doctor's waiting room or the union hall, is so important. There's a powerful sense of shared membership and shared interest, of solidarity, that comes from using these goods in the sight of others. National conservatives understand this point intuitively, and they also understand that there is no requirement that social goods belong to everyone. They can just as well be used to build bonds of solidarity among some at the expense of others. They can just as well be used as tools to rebuild that nebulous lost thing. In the words of Trump's political strategist, Steve Bannon, I'm the guy pushing a trillion dollar infrastructure plan, shipyards, ironworks, get them all jacked up. In pursuing that program, national conservatives can draw on models from the European far right, like Marine Le Pen, who cast immigration as the essential threat to the welfare state, and they can draw on models much closer to home. The heavy subsidies that made possible the interstate connected racially exclusive suburbs of post-war America. The deliberate exclusion of most black workers from FDR's initial version of social security. The well-funded white schools of the segregated South. The state organized colonization of Western Canada. Trump's failure to follow these models was the single most providential failure of his presidency. As frightened as I am of the angry, failed, coup-fomenting version of Trump, I would have been far more frightened of the version of Trump who used state power and public spending to build a durable popularity and a lasting political realignment, shipyards and the Muslim ban, ironworks and the wall. <laughs>
Trump as the American Francois Legault. We might attribute that missed opportunity to Trump's laziness, but we could just as well attribute it to some of the structural forces in American politics. So far, national conservatives have the power to introduce borrowed terms like working class, multinational corporations, and capital into the Republican vernacular. They do not have the power to govern outside the party orthodoxy, at least not yet. But in Canada, I think the equivalent orthodoxy is far weaker. It's not simply that our more tightly regulated elections place at least some limits on the political power of capital. It's that Canada's political culture and nationalism have been bound up with the interventionist state since Confederation. To a far greater extent than in America, Canada's sense of national belonging has been a creature of the state. The state has been its most effective protector against the entropic forces of continental integration and virtual annexation to the US. I suspect that national conservatism will resonate here even more strongly in the years to come because it is a very natural, if ultimately cowardly, set of ideas to have on the edge of an empire. To be a national conservative in America is to acknowledge that even the United States, for all its power, is only a very large province in the empire of capital. And I don't think that a critical mass of Americans is ready for that acknowledgement. <laughs> in Canada, our place on the periphery has never been in doubt. That is a real advantage for the Canadian right. In a determined set of hands, whether belonging to the current leaders of the Federal Conservative Party and its provincial allies or to the leadership a few trial and error iterations down the road, it could reopen a set of questions that most of us believe were closed. It will wear a hard hat or drive a truck. It will identify itself with the working class. It will take naturally to talk about paid off journalists and liberal professors, adding to it the dark figure of the immigrant with whom they are in cahoots. And it will have a growing figure, a growing contingent of allied figures in America and around the world. But as for those of us who see Canada's multinational character. It's since that there is no real Canadian people. It's since that this is fundamentally a country of openness and multiplicity. For those of us who see these features of Canada's history and political culture as essential to its democratic health, what can we do in response? Well, here again, I think the idea of the psychological wage is helpful. National conservatism promises not just a set of material goods, jobs at shipyards or new highways or more healthcare spending, but also exclusive access to these goods, the dedication of those goods to the cultural goal of rebuilding the patriarchal family or the Christian nation. Sometimes, even as wealth continues to concentrate itself, the argument will be put in terms of scarcity. Refugees are the reason your school is crowded. Asylum seekers are the reason you can't see the doctor. Immigrants are the reason you can't buy a house but it is exclusivity rather than scarcity that will do the vital psychological work. It will offer the high pleasures of belonging and the belief, not unheard of among liberal urbanites, that one's consumption serves a higher ethical purpose. It will offer as well the low pleasures of living in some proximity to the excluded and knowing them to be excluded. What we on the left have to offer in opposition to this what the left has always had to offer, is essentially a better material deal. The bigger the bloc negotiating, not just in the formal bargaining of unions, but in the larger negotiations of politics, from voting to street protests and work stoppages, the more power it can bring to bear, the greater the rewards it can secure, the farther we can extend our solidarity, the more we will find our world to be, in a wonderful old word I wish were in greater use, commodious amply furnished with the good things in life, with the time and space it takes to enjoy them. I wish there was something more to say. I wish there were words about our shared humanity that could measure up even a little bit to the power of that vision of the clean, lost world. But there just aren't any. We've known that since at least 1914, when the workers of the world marched off to slaughter one another for God and country all the best socialist talk about international brotherhood bouncing off their helmets, drowned out by their marching bands. Nietzsche said somewhere that the powers that be will always have the best arguments, the drum roll and the fanfare. 
They still do. And this is one of the reasons why the left for much of its history has struggled so mightily. We do not have a better fanfare. Just a set of small, dense, solid things. We are materialists. And if there's ultimately something more than the material in our politics, it comes only through the act of seeking these things alongside others, standing on a picket line with strangers, withholding our labor, and foregoing our wages for the sake of our coworkers, realizing that we share a community of interests even with people with whom we can barely communicate. This is the way to what the great radical thinker Mike Davis called moral self-recognition through solidarity. This is the way to what he called structures of feeling that others would deem spiritual. These feelings do not live outside the world, but in it, in the work alongside others to achieve the most prosaic things, a little more money, a little more time, or in the words of the classic labor demand, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what we will. So when I read other slogans, like democracy dies in darkness, or that democracy is on the ballot, I don't doubt that these are the kinds of slogans that can mobilize voters and win elections from time to time, but I still recoil from them. I recoil because of their fundamental cloying dishonesty. Their patronizing promise that we can skip straight to the spiritual, the stirring heroic defenses of the big abstract nouns, and pass over the hard things of this world. Our challenge is protecting democracy without smothering it in reverence, without treating it like a sacred object, a kind of holy relic that goes on procession every two or four years, whose bearing on our lives is not entirely clear and is never explained in much detail, but which cannot be examined too closely and which must be defended at all costs. Fetishizing democracy tells me nothing about how it will make my life better or fairer or freer in any concrete sense. Fetishizing democracy helps us avoid talking about those things. It is an easy step, deceptively easy, from the idea that democracy is on the ballot to the idea that democracy is only on the ballot, that the unfreedom of the workplace is not really unfreedom, that the dictatorship of the boss is not really dictatorship, that the principle of living together as free and equal people does not apply as long as we're on the clock. But those who fought to bring democracy into being, who knew its absence, who saw what that absence meant in the hard lives of the people on whose behalf they spoke, were entirely willing to speak of it in the least sentimental terms. They understood that democracy was not an idol, not an icon, but a power, a political power, raised up to contend with economic power. They spoke of it in the unabashed terms of need and want, the language of this world, because they cared for democracy, because they feared for it. They could not afford to worship it, nor can we. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I guess I'll start just with a question, and that is, it seems like a central argument of your book is that asserting difference um, between Canada and the United States can act as a buffer to eroding democracy in Canada. So the question that I have for you is, how do we balance this? How do we balance this idea of asserting difference um, with the concept of per, you know, perpetuating a sense of Canadian exceptionalism that maybe sometimes obscures uh, the similarities mm -hmm. and the real problems that exist uh, within Canada, you know, Canada's history, mm -hmm. its past, and its present. Yeah, this is like absolutely a challenge I struggle with in writing the book, and I don't think I have the final answer to it. I, I guess the first thing I'd say is that one, I think I do err on the side of asserting difference because I think there's so much pressure in the other direction. I think about how much news coverage in Canada is dominated by American news. I think of how the front page of the CBC or, or the Globe is quite often what Joe Biden or, or uh, Kevin McCarthy or whoever the new guy is up to, uh, Mike Johnson, I think, um, <laughs> I, or, or Donald Trump. So I, th I think that the baseline for me 
is a sense of, of overwhelming cultural and media saturation. So I think that asserting differences, and part of the reason I think I assert it a lot in this book, is because I think you're, you're starting from a disadvantage, the disadvantage of being saturated with American news and politics. But I, I do think that you're very right to point out the difficulty of overcorrecting, or the problems of overcorrecting, into a sense of Canadian exceptionalism, into a sense of Canadian smugness, or into a sense that all the really bad, ugly, evil things of history, like new settler colonialism and, and racism and, and dispossession of land, and, and the things that make Canada's history so ugly are things that we have to worry about as U.S. contagions, but not things that are inherent to Canadian politics. And I, I don't think that's true. I guess what I try to argue in the book is that if there's any kind of sense of Canadian exceptionalism, I, I think exceptionalism is, is a rough, uh, it, it's such a fraught term, so I don't really use it in the book, but if there's any kind of sense of difference it has to be rooted in the parts of Canadian political culture and history that push against uh, those tendencies. Something that I reference here, the idea of, of Canada as fundamentally a, a country that has a political culture that sees itself as, as multinational, as a country of multiplicities, multiple foundings, multiple histories and stories, multiple national myths. If there's a kind of meta-myth of Canadian culture is that there is not one kind of authoritative story. I think it, it's very easy to you think about getting separation and difference from American democratic erosion and gloss over the uglier parts of Canadian history. And I don't want to be part of that at all. But I, what I do want to be part of is saying that at the very least, there's something there to build on in terms of a, a model of what a multinational democracy can look like in which the kinds of erosion that we've seen in the US, I think, are specifically tied to the notion that there's a specific American people, a real American people that is entitled to rule I think that's a little less plausible here. It doesn't mean it couldn't happen. I, I, I've just, I, I talk quite a bit, I think, about why it might, but I think the resources to protect against it have to be connected to a, a sense of Canadianness or a sense of groundedness in a history because it has to be some kind of relevant response to how these problems present themselves differently in Canadian political culture versus in US political culture. I had a similar opening question. I, maybe I'll take it from a different, push it in a different way. I mean, as I was listening to you, I thought, okay, is this, a, are these differences between the United States and Canada are sort of narcissism or small differences? Mm -hmm. Because in the, in the wider world, mm -hmm. you know, what country is more similar to Canada than mm -hmm. the United States? And even on the question of our welfare system, yeah. you know, scholars who study this say, well, in, in the advanced industrialized democracies of the West, there are liberal welfare systems, there are continental corporatist welfare systems in continental Europe, there's the social democratic ones. No one would describe Canada as a social democratic who studies mm -hmm. this, although we sometimes will say that. So it's true on the one hand, yes, we have universal health care, we have parental leave, universities are still more affordable. Um, but as you say in the book, I mean, a lot of this is fraying. I mean, the health care crisis is, is serious and real. Uh, university tuition is getting more and more unaffordable for so many families. So I guess, you know, I think one question was about that. But the other one I wanted to ask was, and maybe this one, because this is just sort of riffing on what Jennifer had said, is there's something ironic or paradoxical about what you said. Because on the one hand, you said, well, if solidarity means anything, it's got to mean something concrete small, dense things. And that makes sense, because you think deeds matter more than words. Words can be empty and cheap. Like, show me what you mean by solidarity. But then I thought, on the other hand, OK, but then what makes Canada distinctive? Uh, we can say for now it's distinctive vis-a-vis -vis the US because the US welfare doesn't have those things. Mm -hmm. Imagine Bernie Sanders is the next president, or Joe Biden's listening to him if he gets reelected, and they pass all this legislation that makes the U.S. look more like Canada in all these ways. Mm -hmm. What then is the content culturally for you mm -hmm. as an American who's come here? What's distinctive about Canadian nationalism? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the first thing, I, going back to the, the narcissism of small differences point, I, I, this, this is something that I, I really grappled with in the book myself, especially as an immigrant here. Um, I'm someone who, uh, I, I describe in the book, watched the, the January 6th sacking of the Capitol, which is a place where I worked. I saw my actual office on the TV screen um, from my laptop in Toronto. I, I was sitting in the basement during COVID and, and watching these things unfold on a live screen. So 
when I think about the hope that I have that things won't be quite so bad here, sometimes I'm in an optimistic mood and feel like that, and other times I think this is all narcissism of small differences. This is all just sort of tinkering on the, on the margins of the liberal welfare state, and at the end of the day, countries that have so much in common are ultimately, and are so deeply economically and politically and culturally entangled, are going to go down the same road sooner or later. So part of the reason I think the narcissism of small differences is almost a good frame for this problem is if it's the case that, that Canadian democracy is not quite so eroded as it's American democracy, and I guess that's like uncontroversial in some ways. I think it could be, but I don't think we've gone down that road yet. Part of what I want to do is focus on these small differences of saying, is there anything there that explains the difference? Oops, sorry. Is there anything there that explains those differences? Um, but also on, on the question of what would be different about a sense of Canadian nationalism if you know, if, say, Bernie Sanders were elected and passed the whole kind of social democratic uh, far-left program in America, I think what still might be different is that there's a different cultural substrate in Canada that, that I think serves as something of a backstop. Not something necessarily as a backstop, but I think actually kind of makes those policies a little bit more necessary. And the way I describe this is I'm, I'm trying to describe the relationship between the welfare state and, and notions of national solidarity through myth and the kind of argument that I just made. And part of what I want to say is, is not that the Canadian welfare state is so great or that it's a model like the world and say the way that the Scandinavian welfare states are, but that there's so little to fall back on. So when I think about that sense of distinctiveness that I noticed when I came here about what I see and then learn about Canada's public culture and what I've learned about Canada's public culture from having um, two young kids and, and soon three when she's old enough in the public schools is the sense that um, it's not a country with a monomyth. It's a country that, that tries to understand itself and tell a story of itself as made up of many founding peoples with many stories and, and not kind of one national destiny in the way that I think it's really easy to fall into in, in American public education, the kind of education that I got coming up in American schools, which all centers on these uh, unifying, charismatic, climactic moments around the Revolution and the Constitution or, or perhaps the Civil War and Reconstruction. I, I think that's harder to pull off here. And what that means is not necessarily that therefore we're going to have a great social safety net that's going to save us and, and solve our problems. It means that if we don't, if things continue to fray, there's going to be much less to backstop it. There's going to be much less to solve that problem, which, which kind of brings me around to the case that this national conservatism I describe, which in some ways is a force in American politics, could potentially be even more of a force in Canadian politics five or ten years down the road, because once you've had a generation or more of, of neoliberal policies fraying what we have of a welfare state, there's not much else there to take its place in the public culture. And when that's the case, I think that's when you especially end up with especially um, angry, sweaty, exaggerated versions of national greatness of the kind the national conservatives make so much of. Yeah, I want to pick up on that, actually, because <clears throat> in your reading and throughout your book, uh, one of the things that you've talked about is that, you know, is this idea of sort of multiple founding histories of Canada mm -hmm. or about this idea that we don't necessarily have the same shared perceived history, I think that you said. And I guess I want to know how deep you think that goes because, um, like, I think there's different forms of national narratives. And, for example, the myth of multiculturalism in itself can be a national narrative or, you know. And so I'm wondering whether or not you think how deeply you think it goes that we no longer have this kind of national narrative that shapes kind of the history of Canada? Because I think there's a lot of people that, you know, in, in 2020 and 2021 would argue that if you look at our education system, if you, you know, if you look at our national narratives, that there, that there remains this really sort of strong sense of, of a Canadian history from which many groups still kind of feel excluded. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is how, how deep, because you've also talked about like the you know, the, the fact that we've, we've struggled with the ideas of, like, our founding fathers, whatever, and we, you know, but are we past that? Like, how, how deep have we really engaged with that? Yeah. Well, I think we can always engage with it more deeply. And I think part of the problem that I'm describing is I, I think just in the way that I describe these sort of cheap gestures of solidarity that I think are such a, a, a prominent part of, of, of the American kind of myth of the founding, Canada does that too. I, I don't want to single out land acknowledgments because we, we do that here, but I do this in my class. I have a land acknowledgement in my class, so I certainly don't want to act like I'm above this, but I see this as a form of, of me, especially as, as a white guy performing a kind of act of solidarity that in some ways is, I, I think it's better than the alternative. I, I think it's, it's I, I think about the students in that class that 
wouldn't even have thought about the indigenous history of the place where they're living. Um, if, if not for that, it's something that I never had, was pushed to think about by anyone through four years of undergraduate education in the States. And yet, it's, it's, it's words, and yet it's not solid and concrete. So that question of how deep it goes is, is very much an open question for me. Um, I guess the argument I want to make in, in the book is I don't want to be so much bound to the case that Canada has solved these problems or that Canada is a country in which um, a kind of far right that centers on this myth of national greatness, even if our kind of national greatness is the kind of like restrained, modest Canadian version, I, I don't want to suggest <laughs> that that's never going to happen here because I'm sure it, it could in a very sort of modest way, right? Yeah. With, with, a, with a fleece jacket and all sorts of nice words about multiculturalism at the same time. It, it certainly could. I guess I'm more interested in trying to make the argument that if we are to avoid these things, if we are to avoid going down that road, it's by leaning into the aspects of Canadian political history and culture that help us. One of which is you, you have a commitment, some kind of public verbal commitment to this sort of version of a decentralized multiplicity story of, of your past and your history. Well, if that's true, here are some things that flow for it. Here are some things that flow from it. Here are some commitments that flow from it. You know, for instance, I talk in the, about reconciliation in the context mm -hmm. of this in the book, and why, you know, despite you know the Trudeau government coming to office in 2015 with some uh, a lot of great press and a lot of momentum behind the, the effort it was going to put behind reconciliation, you know, we get to a point in, in 2023 where this is sort of described across the board as stalled and barely off the ground and then deeply disappointing. Um, so, but I, the reason I talk about it in this context is saying that things like the progress of reconciliation, things like the strength of the social safety net, they don't just go in one bucket and then there's the democracy bucket over here. There's the democracies eroding, by the way, on page one, and on page two, reconciliation talks break down and, and Doug Ford's showing 40 kids into kindergarten class these days and, and you know, who knows. I, I try to talk about these things as very much in the democracy bucket. These are very much the kind of things that if we focus on not just in terms of words and the kind of national stories we promote, but in concrete actions like, say, um, uh, thinking about dedicated indigenous representation in parliament. These are the kinds of things that help us, I think, lean into the features of national myth that can be helpful here for our specific problems. I was wondering if I could change direction a little bit. So we've been talking about nationalism, mm -hmm. solidarity. Uh, another really important part of the book, of course, is comparing the political systems uh, and then the attendant political cultures of the United States and Canada. And I think that's where it's not a narcissism, small differences, because they're quite different systems, right? So you have a presidential system in the United States. They're both federal democracies, but quite different federal democracies. So you have a presidential system in the U.S. We have Westminster model here. And the argument has always been, political scientists, I study this, and say, well, the parliamentary system, the Westminster, is better for power sharing and compromise negotiation because it's not a winner-take-all system that there's a president and that you know, there's one office and so on. And yet, when, and so there's a theory of how these two systems should work, and should there, there should be no, more negotiation, compromise, and so on, in a parliamentary one. And we do see deadlock in the United States. We see deadlock in other presidential systems when there's two different parties that are capturing the legislature and the presidency, like in France, for instance. And yet, as we know in Canada, the prime minister's office regardless of which party's been in power for the last decade or more, it centralizes power in an unbelievable way. Um, party leaders have enormous power over MPs. You see it in the papers all the time. MPs don't really speak and say what they want. So on the one hand, they're meant to represent us as constituents, but who defies the party line? Um, and, and there seems to be quite little contestation in our politics. I mean, I remember reading, I think it was Samara, the Samara Center of Democracy put out a report a few years ago saying, extraordinary figure, something like 79% of all candidates at federal parties, if I remember this correctly, who run for that party in a federal election are essentially just anointed. I mean, no one runs against them. Mm -hmm. So we don't seem to have a lot of democratic politics going on in our political democracy in lots of ways. Power is really concentrated. It's really personalized. And in that sense, the United States, as combustible and fractious and as it is, there seems to be a lot more churn mm. in its politics. And through that conflict, conflict itself can be quite democratically progressive. So how do you, how do you think about that? I mean, is there sort of a sort of conservatism and a stasis in our politics as well? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think one of the sources of, of the churn in American politics is, is the kind of struggle over the national myth or the kind of struggle over national belonging that, that I think Du Bois speaks to, this idea that I think the progressive forces in America have, have often been on the front lines of these issues and have often been the, the most heroic voices in defense of multiracial democracy because it's in America that the, the most sophisticated attacks against multiracial democracy have been pioneered and provoked. So I think in many ways it, it's a place of extremes. I think that's something in, in many ways I miss about American political culture, maybe not on a day-to-day -day basis, but when I take a step back in the way that you did. But I also think that, that you're right to point out the kinds of stasis and, and depoliticization that, that are inherent in, in Canada's form of parliamentary government. You know, I come from this from the perspective of, of rhetoric and deliberation because these are some of the things that I study as a, as a political theorist. And I think about parliamentary government as it's supposed to work, in theory, as a form of government that is designed to put deliberation and argument and, and talk at the center of government. It, it comes from a word for talk, but not just that. It's about the public clash of opposing arguments. Um, it, it's government by discussion, as a lot of the thinkers of the great age of parliamentary democracy and its first kind of flourishing in, in um, 19th century uh, Europe talked about. Um, so I think that that's really valuable in theory, that what parliamentary democracy does is some of its great exponents, like, like Walter Badgett and, and John Stuart Mill talk about, is allow government and opposition to have everything contested, to have every kind of possible case you put on the table in a way that is supposed to educate the public, that is supposed to show to people watching on the news or reading in the papers at the time what the actual arguments for and against are in ways that are also, and, and I love the way that Badgett makes this claim in the 19th century, in ways that are also surrounded by drama, in ways that draw us in as spectators because something can happen. You know, theoretically in a parliament with, with responsible government, the government can fall because it makes bad arguments, or the government can fall because it doesn't win people over. Now, that, that's the theory and the model. Of course, that doesn't happen at all. And, and there are a lot of reasons why it doesn't happen. Part of the reasons are the development of mass parties, the ways that these very deliberative parliaments were, were elitist in ways that we wouldn't accept. So there are lots of ways we've transitioned away from this. But you add to this not just the changes in parliamentary democracy since the time when it was kind of first theorized, but you add to this the, the, the things that you discussed, the fact that, that our parties are basically set up as, as oligarchic structures, the, the idea that there's precious little actual deliberation that goes on in Parliament, the idea that, that we all know that Prime Minister's questions is, is a joke, but, but in every parliamentary system with Prime Minister's questions, it's a joke, that there's not, that, that arguments in Parliament don't actually do anything, and as a result, there, there aren't really any arguments, um, or at least meaningful arguments. There's, there's a lot of yelling and, and shouting and throwing things, and occasionally we applaud for a Nazi for some reason, but it, it's a very, very um, disappointing application of what these principles are supposed to be. So I think about what to do about this, and I try to think about what inspires me and the spirit of people who are laying out the ideals of parliamentary democracy, even though they're doing it in a much less democratic age. They're talking about the values of, of deliberation and argument, public argument and surprise. And I think that there's something there that can be recaptured in a different form. So I, I talk a little bit about the value of citizen assemblies, the value of um, using randomly selected bodies of ordinary people, uh, like juries, to solve public problems, whether to do oversight, as some people want to do, or maybe to do more substantive arguments, like uh, amending voting systems or constitutions. And they, they can be used in anything from the regulatory level to the constitutional level. So I think what's really interesting about this possibility is that you know, citizen assemblies don't come with people's partisan opinions necessarily preformed. They, there are opportunities for people to actually deliberate and convince one another and change their minds because they're encountering issues as ordinary people um, for the relatively first time. Uh, so part of what I think about as a kind of democratic innovation is, is trying to struggle with the question of how can we take these ideals that make parliamentary government valuable, that, that make parliamentary government something worth fighting for, that are so clearly not instantiated in the parliamentary system we have. What kind of different institutions could we use to put those values to better use? So one thing I came up with, not came up with, but one thing I discussed in the book as a possibility is citizen assemblies. I'm not so much wedded to that particular model as wedded to the idea of trying to find different institutional forms that can house the, these normative commitments that I think are still really valuable. Yeah.